Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being a part of this wonderful work, worship experience as we're here to celebrate, and we're here this Sunday morning to bless the Lord. I, I trust that you were blessed by the worship experience, and as we're getting into the Word of God, um, we've been dealing with the topic of prayer, and prayer is something that God has put on my heart uh, as a pastor to really focusing in on the Lord, and I pray that uh, the messages that we have been sharing over the past several weeks are inspiring you and encouraging you to spend more time with God and spend more time praying with others. And so today, I have a word coming from Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 15. And as we're, we're sharing the word today, I trust that it will encourage you, but also challenge us to really become the type of prayer people, praying people, that he wants in this day and this time. I want to read from Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 15. If you have a Bible, if you want to look at the screen or if you have a tablet, certainly follow along with us. Starting from verse 8, it says, And the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men to go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands and on, on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. I want to speak to you on the topic today of this is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. Let's pray. Father, thank you. For the word of God, we pray it would strengthen us. We pray it would encourage us. We pray, Lord, that it would help us, Lord, in this battles and struggles that we have personally and the spiritual warfare that we are engaged in. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when battles can be won or lost based upon how they're fought. And whether it's an army, a sports team, a church, a business, a family, it can come down to one thing, and that is a strategy. And so when we encounter battles, one thing that we have to make sure that we understand that if you don't have a strategy, it's going to be very easy to lose. In fact, you probably can be expected to lose a battle. No person that goes to war would actually enter into a war or conflict without some type of strategy, some type of plan. So we are living in what I would call unconventional times. Um, and the reason why I call it unconventional because it's different. It's something we're not used to. We don't have a point of reference. If you told me uh, we'd still not be able to meet together in our facility and have worship service, it's pretty much unconventional for us, don't you think? It's, it's, it's a place where we have to think differently. We have to come at it with a different strategy, a different approach. And so it is with life. Life is different for us right now. If you remember 9-11, 9-11 when the, the Twin Towers were hit with the, the, with the planes, it changed travel forever. It's gonna, it, it just changed the whole landscape of travel. And so we have to understand that as we're living in these unconventional times, that we need a strategy, we need a different approach as it relates to how we live from day to day. 
When we look at this passage of scripture, we see that there is a war that has ensued. And as the Amalekites are now coming against the children of Israel. Now, now if you don't know anything about Amalek, let me just kind of give you a little bit of a, a kind of a history on who this army is that's ready to come against Israel. Actually, they're related. They're descendants of Esau. If you ever read, read your Bible and you know uh, that there, is a, there are two brothers, there's Jacob and Esau. And these two brothers have actually been at war for some time. In fact, they've been at war for many generations. Uh, they, you know, Esau you know, was, was one who actually, he was a, he's the grandson. And, and so when you think about Esau, Esau is the oldest, but Jacob stole his birthright away from him. And Esau was upset, so upset that he, he actually chased Jacob around trying to kill him. And over time, these two brothers and their descendants were at war with each other. It's almost like it was like a family feud kind of thing. And so when the time came, you'll find that in different places, as Israel would journey, they were fighting with the Amalekites. And in this place right now where they're in Rephidim, as the children of Israel are traveling from Egypt and going towards the promised land, they're trying to find rest. But now they're being ambushed by the Amalekites. The thing about the Amalekites, the Amalekites were ruthless. They were, they were, they were kind of army that actually took no prisoners, as it were. They were out to kill. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 to 19, gives us a little glimpse of how vicious the Amalekites were. The word tells us that, uh, the Lord says, remember what the Amalekites did along the way when you came out of Egypt. And verse 18 of chapter 25 says, and when you were weary and worn out, they met you along the journey and attacked all. Now listen, they attacked all who were lagging behind and had no fear of God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies around you in the land that he's given you to possess as inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Am Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget this. So what the Lord is saying is it, Amalek is a vicious group of violent people who take advantage of those who are vulnerable and most vulnerable in life. They took advantage of sick people. They took advantage of those who were young. They took advantage of those who seemed to be lagging behind. It's interesting that the Amalekites who generally not go after the strong, they will go after the weak. And so this is a picture of how vicious they actually were. The thing about this battle that the Israelites are engaged in, the Amalekites are there to stop them from moving forward. Do you know that you're, you have an enemy that's trying to stop you from moving forward? You're, you have an enemy that is out there that is trying to destroy and to attack you when you're at your most vulnerable moments. And the enemy, called the Amalekites, they were trying to attack Israel at their most vulnerable place in their vulnerable moments because they didn't have real skills in fighting. They were actually slaves being released to go to the promised land didn't have a lot of warriors, a lot of fighters. And so they, they saw the Israelites as easy prey for them. When we look at this story, we can see that God has something in mind to teach the children of Israel as well as to help them to understand what it means to be victorious in battle. Do you know that when we go through life, that there are lessons that God teaches us about how we are to engage in struggle and how we are able to have victory in the things that seem to be so difficult. So I want to share three lessons, just some things that I observed from the text to encourage you about what it really means to, to win in this battle, in this place where you might even feel vulnerable. You might even feel that you're not going to be able to win and that the odds are against you. But God is saying that he can teach us how to fight battles. So the first thing that we see here is that 
There is a spiritual side. This is the first thing. There's a spiritual side to the battles we face. Sometimes when we think about battles, we think about it's, it's, a, it's a something that we just, are, just see with our eyes or something that we have a feeling that's really happening. But it's also spiritual. In verse 9, the Bible says that Moses says to Joshua that as the Amalekites were tackling, uh, attacking them, he says, choose some men. And go out and fight the Amalekites. And he said, tomorrow, this is Moses saying, tomorrow I'm going to go up to the hill and I'm going to have the staff of God in my hands. Well, Moses is saying, look, Joshua, you, you, there's a ground attack and there's a counterattack that you have, to, you have to engage in when it comes to fighting these Amalekites. And, you know, when it comes to facing our battles, you never can win a battle if you don't face it. Just because we have God on our side doesn't mean we don't show up. Uh, I, I talk to many Christians sometimes and say, you know, uh, you know, God will handle everything for me. I don't have to do a thing. Wait a minute now. You see here that Joshua still has to show up for the battle. He still has to be engaged in the battle. God is not allowing us to just kind of slip away and just allow him to do everything for us. He, he, he wants us to be engaged. And there are some battles that you're just going to have to face. You can't run from it. They couldn't run back to Egypt from the Amalekites. They had to face the reality that the battle is in front of them and be really understanding that, you know what, the only way they can defeat the Amalekites, they had to face them. What are you running from that you need to face? What problem or difficulty are you trying to escape that God is saying to you, hey, just go and let's, let's go and face this because you never win what you're afraid to face. And so here it is. Moses goes up on top of this hill with the staff in his hands. I imagine Joshua probably said, you know, Moses has sent me down and he told me to choose some leaders to go down and, and fight this battle. But why is he going up on this hill? Why is he going up on, on this hill? You know, couldn't, couldn't we use Moses and the rod down in the valley? Moses said, no, I'm going up on the hill. The thing about battles that we see here that there's, there's a ground attack but there's also an air attack. We see that Moses understands that he needs to be in the place of an intercessor. And he's the go-between God and the people. And as he would bring the rod of God and lift it up, the rod of God is the symbol of the power of God. He knows that Joshua needs more than just his skill, his wit, the company of leaders that he has fighting the battle, he needs the power of God. Intercessors, let me tell you something. Being a person who stands between and a person who intercedes for others and brings their causes and cases to God is of much value. Sometimes we don't see the value of intercessors. Sometimes we don't see them because they're, they're behind the scenes. And, and Moses is not engaged in the hand-to-hand -hand combat, but nonetheless, he's up on the mountain with the rod of God stretched out, with his hands lifted up. And we find here that when his hands are lifted up, Joshua wins. Joshua's winning because he has his hands up. He has his rod up before the throne of God. It shows us that we as a people of God need to understand that there's a spiritual dimension to the battles that we face. Let me take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. It says, and Paul writes, he says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to verse 13, Paul says, encourages the church. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power 
of his might or in his mighty power. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes or strategies. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities and against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces. Listen, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. It's important to understand that this, this, is, a, this is a way that we fight our battles. We, we don't fight it with carnal means or fleshly means. We don't have, we don't have the capacity to win this type of battle with just having spears and bowls and artillery that's in the natural because it's not about flesh and blood. It's about the principalities and powers and the things that are going on behind what's happening. And so we're engaged in spiritual battle. We need to, we need to make sure that we are spiritually prepared for the battles that we have to fight. Second thing I observe here is that we need spiritual support in times of our battles. If you notice here that when Moses has lifted up his, the rod of God and he lifts up his hands, Joshua's winning. But you'll notice that he couldn't sustain that posture very long. I mean, this was a long battle. This battle went on for quite a while, actually all day. And imagine just lifting your hands and keeping your hands up all day, even with nothing in it. I'm sure that they would get heavy. You'd get tired. And spiritual battles make us tired. You may think that being, you're tired just because you didn't get a great sleep last night, and that's probably true. You may be tired because you have some long work hours. That's possibly true. You might be you know, tired because you've been looking at screens all day and Zooming all day and being on team meetings all day on virtual platforms, that's possibly true. But it might be that you're tired because you've been, under, you've been under siege in a spiritual battle. You've been dealing with some spiritual things that has made you tired. And so here Moses, his hands start to slip. His hands start to go down. And once his hands start to go down, something happens in the battle on the ground with Joshua. He notices that the momentum shifts and Joshua starts to lose. Could it be that a lot of times that we find ourselves losing ground is because our hands are slipping in intercession and prayer? We're losing our grip on prayer. We're losing our grip to come before the Father. We're losing it because our strength has been waning because the battle has been very long. But thank God he had Aaron and her. And when Aaron and her uh, saw that Moses' hands were slipping, they said, you know, we notice that Joshua wins when his hands are up. So we need to do all we can to lift up the hands of Moses. And they lift up his hands and they, they set, it, set his hands up and use a stone. And they, they begin to brace it up so his hands are actually established and, and staying in the position because they're supporting him. Do you know that we as leaders, we depend upon the support of others particularly intercessors in our prayer. That praying, praying for your leaders and praying for the people who are in the battle is very important because without that support, could it be that's why we're losing the battles? Could it be that if we had more support in prayer that we wouldn't have families that are being torn apart Children who are running away. Things that happen in our lives don't happen by accident. And could it be that intercessors and people who will support in prayer can actually cause something to shift and God's purposes can be established? So we need spiritual support at times. You and I need spiritual support. You can't do this alone. Put it in the chat box, you know, put it in the chat box today. So, you know, you, you just can't do this alone. You can't. There's so many people that fail because they try to do it alone. 
We're not meant to do it alone. You're meant to be a part of a community of people who can support you, not just emotionally, but also to bring you before the throne of God and support you in prayer. The third thing is here, and the final thing that I just want to say around this is you don't want to forget God when you get the victory. It isn't amazing that we can easily forget the God who gave us victory. We can easily just kind of go on our merry way and just kind of forget that it was God. We, we might think it's us. If, if Joshua thought it was him that gained the victory, he, he's, he's not really looking very close enough. Because the truth of the matter is, no matter how, many, how much resources and how skillful we are, and how good we think our strategy is, without God, we're absolutely nothing. It's going to be a lost cause. See, the Bible says that Joshua, in verse 13, that Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So one might think it was the sword that did it. No, it wasn't really the sword that did it, because here's what you want to listen to in verse 14. He says, then the Lord said to Moses, Moses, Joshua is probably just relishing the fact that he overcame by the sword. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to write this on a scroll. And I want you to let him know that he needs to remember these things and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I'm going to completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. The Lord said, let Joshua know that it wasn't simply his sword I used the sword, but it wasn't the sword that brought the battle. I was the one, the Lord said, that brought the battle, battle to an end. I'm the one that gave him victory, and he needs to remember that. And the Bible says that when Moses, in verse 15, he, he shared with Joshua and said, Joshua, let me tell you what was going on up on the hill. When I had my hands lifted up, you're winning. When my hands started to get weary, thank God that we had Aaron and her to lift up my hands. Because when my hands were falling, going down, you were actually going to lose. And I want you to remember this, Joshua, that though you think that you are smart, clever, that you have your posse, that you have a whole lot of good people and smart people around you, you had never would have won this battle without the Lord being your banner. You know why? He says, the battle is really not yours. The battle is the Lord's. See, sometimes we think that we're using God to fight our battles. But maybe God is trying to use you to fight a battle. We're so interested in saying, God, we're trying to get you involved in our skirmishes and our fights and our battles and our struggles. And God is saying, wrong way. The only reason that you're involved in this battle because I want to use you as my servant, as my instrument, because I'm the one that's going to wipe out Am Amalek, not you. So here it is. He builds an altar of worship. He builds an altar of worship. See, when God gives you victory, not only are you to remember it, but your response should be, God, I worship you. I magnify you. He built this altar called and called it uh, the Lord is my banner, or one would say Jehovah Nissi. It's the name unto God. That his name was written over it. His banner or the victory was flying high, but the victory was not Joshua's name flying on the banner, or Moses' name on the banner, or their name up in lights, it was the name of God. And so because we are living in unconventional times, it calls for unconventional strategies. Wouldn't you say that was an unconventional strategy? One would think that, you know, when you have a battle, just send all your artillery down there with all your, your fighting men that actually could actually handle an army but they really didn't have that. But prayer and intercession, why one, may, one may say, you know, I'm not too sure prayer does a whole lot. But prayer is an unconventional strategy. And when they entered into this battle, we can see 
that we're only going to win battles when we are interceding, when we're standing at the throne of God in prayer. And so for those of you watching, maybe, maybe you're in a battle right now. Maybe you're in a struggle right now, and you've been doing all you can and figuring out all different kinds of ways to address the struggle. But one thing you may have left out is the fact that you left out prayer. Maybe you also need some people around you to pray with you, to actually be with you in this very difficult season of your life. Don't be ashamed to tell people, hey, you know, I'm, I'm in a real battle right now, and I'd like you to pray. I'd like you to hold up my, my hands in prayer. I'd like, I'd like you to come alongside because I realize that even though I've shown up for this battle, I need more support in prayer because I recognize there's a spiritual dimension to this battle that we're in. And so maybe you're tired. And maybe the, your tiredness is not due to the fact that you've been working so many hours of the day. Maybe it's because it's a battle with the enemy. You're engaged in what we call spiritual warfare. And you need that support. You need that time with God. And I want to invite you this week. I want to invite you, for those of you who are, are fighting battles, to not give up. But say, God, help me to bring along some intercessors, some people around me, some people that can hold my hands up. Reach out to people this week. Reach out to someone else and say, hey, let's agree in prayer. Because when we do that, victory will be ours. And so today I want to encourage you. After service today, we're going to have a time when you can actually go and uh, have a, someone pray for you and pray with you. And if you need prayer, if you, you need prayer, you're in spiritual battle, you're in a, a difficult place, get on the Zoom call and let someone agree with you in prayer. And for those of you who are intercessors, I want to call you today and challenge you to come to a higher level, come into a higher place, because those who are battling on the ground, they need your prayer if they're going to win this battle in life. And so today, I urge you to pray. I encourage you to get on the Zoom call and be prayed for. And I, and I trust that you would understand and know that when you're having a battle, ask yourself, Lord, help me. Ask, ask the Lord, say, Lord, help me to fight my battles in a way that you want me to so that we can win. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity that we've come to worship, to hear a word from you. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that those who are listening and under the sound of my voice, Father, I pray, Lord, that we would not approach unconventional times with traditional processes, traditional ideas, things that worked in the past won't work right now. And so, Father, I pray that we have new approaches, unconventional approaches for unconventional times, things that we have not been used to doing, but God, we thank you for prayer. It moves us out of our comfort zone, and it helps us, Lord, to understand that there is certainly a spiritual battle that's going on. And so, Lord, thank you for the courage. Thank you, Lord, for raising up more and more intercessors. I praise you and honor you because, Lord, as intercessors are raised up, leaders' hands will be raised up, and victory will be won. Thank you for Jesus, who won the victory for us. And we praise your name, and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, and thank you so much for listening to the word. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. Maybe you never invited him into your heart or into your life. Maybe you've gone to church. Maybe you've watched the broadcasts from time to time. And maybe this is your first time. I'd like to give you an opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. If you just open up your heart, Jesus will come in. He will be the Lord of your life. He will actually be Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who fights for you. 
he'll also be the one who brings salvation. He'll be your Joshua. And so pray this prayer with me and open up your heart to receive Christ. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today for this opportunity to hear a word from you. Father, I open my heart. I open my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Lord, cleanse me, mold me, shape me. I believe that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again. And today, based upon that, that fact that Jesus Christ is now alive, I open my heart to him. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to help me walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. If that was your prayer today. We'd like you to just write us a note. You can go to alccambridge.org. You can go and you can write us an email at uh, info at alccambridge.org. And you can write us a note. And we'll certainly get back to you and help you with your next steps in growing with Christ. Thank you for listening.